Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Last week, we talked about the sacrifice of Isaac. Uh, in the last of seven times, Yahweh appears and establishes his covenant with Abraham. Yahweh has asked Abraham to sacrifice his beloved son, and just when Abraham is about to complete his obedience and kill Isaac, the Lord provides a substitute, a ram caught in the thicket. Abraham was the first of the three patriarchs, as when God identifies himself to his people, he often calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So today we're moving on in our conversation from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob, and especially to the contrast between Jacob and his twin brother Esau. But let's deal with Isaac quickly first, and we can deal with him quickly, although we certainly won't exhaust his story, because his life is so similar to Abraham's. In fact, Gerhardus Voss says in his book, Biblical Theology, that basically you can tell Isaac's story just by saying that he lived where Abraham lived and did what Abraham did. Uh, but the Bible doesn't do that. It spells out what Isaac did, and Voss posits a reason for that. Uh, I'm going to read a quote from him. He says, if, therefore, there be such a scarcity of the new, such a lack of assertive originality in the story of Isaac, the reason for this must lie in the need of thus expressing some important revelation principle. The redeeming work of God passes by its very nature through three stages. Its beginnings are marked by a high degree of energy and productivity. They are creative beginnings. The middle stage is a stage of suffering and self-surrender, and is therefore passive in its aspect. This in turn is followed by the resumed energy of the subjective transformation, characterizing the third stage. So that's a little bit of foreshadowing, or a teaser, if you will, about what we can expect to see in the life of the third patriarch, Jacob, and on a greater scale in redemptive history, as we see the covenants of promise in the Old Testament, the patient suffering of the sacrificed son, and then the transformative outworking of redemption through the preaching of the gospel throughout the world. So there's some big picture overview. Now to zoom in on Jacob, we've, well, we're on. introduced. Okay. You brought it up, so if we're going okay. to talk about Isaac. There's a couple things about there's a couple things about Isaac that I think are worth saying. It swings around this. It's hard to be and Robin. Batman <laughs> and Robin. And Robin. <laughs> Abraham yeah. and Isaac. Abraham amassed a fortune, left everything behind, father of the faithful. Uh, fought a war against overwhelming odds and rescued his uh, his nephew. Isaac didn't do all that. Yeah, he did some of the same things that Abram did. The one or two times he came into conflict, conflict, he solved them by not fighting. <laughs> he 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 refused to fight. He refused to escalate, and he backed off and tried it someplace else. And when that didn't work, he backed off until people gave him room. I have both. And um, he also tried farming, something his, his father had never done. God blessed it greatly. But at, and, and I think this does at least potentially lead into our discussion of Esau. Because when you are a Robin and you've stood in the shadow of Batman long enough, you look back and you ask yourself, what exactly have I done? And I think we can, we can justify this, this kind of question by looking at our own attitude toward Isaac. Yeah, and Isaac did what exactly? <laughs> um, he's the second in the list of patriarchs. He submitted to being sacrificed, submitted to passivity. Now, when we, I, I, with all due respect to Dr. Voss, I think he's missed something. It's easy to say that suffering is passive. I don't think Jesus found it so. <laughs> no. I think the cross was warfare. But it's easy to under, to misunderstand, and particularly in in us, who are not Jesus and who far too often fall into suffering contrary to our best wishes. We, oh, Lord, I don't want to suffer this. For us, it often can seem a lot more passive. In fact, it is a lot more passive, but it wasn't for Jesus. Uh, and and I, I think it, it may well be that it, toward the end of Isaac's life, he looked back and and maybe viewed his life the same way Christians do. Now, that, that was unexciting. I didn't do much. Copied my dad, kind of, but he fought. I just, you know, backed away a few times. And then he has sons. I've been a Christian school teacher for a long time. And before that, I was in Christian school, high school. And oftentimes, 
I saw and see fathers trying to relive their lives in their sons. Mm. Don't you want your son to be like, well, like granddad, because I obviously didn't do much, did I? Hmm. So I, I think there's a great deal to be said for what Isaac was, but I'm not sure that even he saw it. He was an image of Jesus. It doesn't get much better than that. And in the centuries that followed, the rabbis would point back to the sacrifice of Isaac as the redemption of Israel and all sacrifices that followed as mere repetitions and, and pointers backward. They kind of got the arrows turned around. But they reckon this is a very important thing. And for us, we look at the faith of Abraham in giving up his son. And I think we easily forget Isaac was a big strapping boy. He didn't have to put up with that. <laughs> but right. he did. And that was scary. I was going to say, we, we aren't told that Isaac had to be subdued uh, oh. by force. It it I mean, it. It very well could be that he was, but we're not told <laughs> Look, that. whatever could that be? <clears throat> uh. ah. Yeah, it could have been that, but more than likely, a, you know, Abraham loved his son. Yeah. He wouldn't do that <laughs> on the way to killing him. It, it, that would, I think that would have been a bit too much for him to handle, uh, emotionally and speaking. I, I mean, I think Isaac could do the math. Like, okay, we're going up the mountain to make a sacrifice. We got the wood. We got the r rope. We got the... Mm. Wait. Wait a second. We're missing <laughs> something. Well, yeah, and we we see all these things in popular culture that that make reference to this event, and most of the time it's you know they're coming back down the mountain afterwards, mm. and Isaac's being very sarcastic uh, towards his father, but that is most likely not the case. I mean, he's no. still considered one of the, the the patriarchs along with his father, and even though he may not have been uh, e extremely mature at the time we can we can make some inferences yeah i mean if your father leveled a gun at you and said god told me to do this <laughs> i'd have some questions <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna carry that one any further um there would be concerns let's just put it that there way would, there, would, there would be concerns but isaac had watched abraham walk with god for a very long time and he believe what his father told him now i notice his father ties him up you know you don't when i'm plunging the knife i really don't want you moving because i want to do this fast be done with it so god can do the resurrection thing <laughs> I, I think we, we have to factor this in now again as we look at all of these men and i, I think someone maybe you and Lee, somebody said this last time these men are by no means perfect and pristine in their faith there's there's weaknesses there's sin there's unbelief but it's all along the pathway toward the promise. Even when they sin, when they stumble, they're stumbling on that pathway. They they see the promise from afar, and at no point do they say, why am I even here? Let's go back to Sumer. Let's go back to Ur. Forget all this. Or let's just go find a big city and and settle down and have a good old time. It kind of worked for, oh, well, didn't, I guess. There's, <laughs> there's none of that. They, they never do look back. They believe that God has spoken to them and what he's promising is nothing less than the salvation of the world. And even when they, they sin, when they get lose focus, that's what they're losing focus on. Which brings us to uh, Isaac's two boys. I am sure that if you talk to Isaac and said, this, having, having children is important to you, right? Well, yes. And, and, and boys, because one of them is going to be the answer to the Messiah. Well, absolutely. That's why we're here. This is why I, I, my father sent to the ends of the earth to get the woman who would share this life with me. Yes, I talk to her. She's very firm about that. In fact, that her wife, her life would be worthless without this promise. So it's so you're you're training them and preparing them to be the 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 ancestors, the great patriarchs like you. I, I I'm I'm trying. I'm so and it's going to be Esau, of course. <laughs> Blink. Lisa is the firstborn. Well, yeah. And he's a manly man. That's one word for it. And um, yeah, he can do what, what dad did. He can take on armies. I've seen him. He's, he's great on the battle. He's great with the sword. Brings brings in food. Makes great meals, you know. What's what's Rebecca think about this? Well, she's kind of fond of Jacob. I understand that, you know. But <sighs> Lisa. <sighs> Now, it would be easy to say, you're making that up. 
until we read what scripture actually <laughs> says because i'm not making up much in what i just said i'm trying to to grasp for an explanation of what otherwise seems odd but what's odder still is that most of the church for 2000 years has sided with isaac well of course it should have been it should have been esau he got a, a bum deal here if, if if jacob hadn't been so treacherous and tripped things up the promise would have gone to him but jacob was just this this scuzzy uh it's all about me kind of guy and um poor poor esau poor esau so with that in mind <laughs> <laughs> Let's read the text of Scripture. This is uh, Genesis 25, and uh, beginning with verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, a sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, I want you to notice that. Isaac is the one who did the intercession, but Rebekah is the one that God speaks to. Which mm -hmm. makes her something, at least on this occasion, of a prophetess. God does not bypass her. God does not say, where's your husband, lady? I need to talk to someone male here. It's Isaac who's kind of left out of the loop on this one, uh, at least initially. We, we would hope that she told him what God said. Uh, anyway, God says, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So she's having some kind of distress in the womb, and God says, well, there's twins. And, and maybe it's not wholly clear whether he's saying they're fighting because they're already at odds or this is merely a parable of how they're going to be when they get older. But in any case, it is very clear that God has set his blessing upon one other than rather than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in a row. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. Isn't this just what we all want our kids to look like? Mm. He's just cute. draped. So in... cute. <laughs> You're not supposed to any of you remember the Adams family, cousin It. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Get him a hat. Yeah. Um, red all over. Beast like as it were called his name Esau, and after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob, a supplanter. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. It took 20 years for the babies to come along. God was not in a hurry, and they apparently had waited very patiently. Of course, people live longer then. But eventually, they both got to the point where she said, uh, Honey, we need to do something here. And rather than go marry a servant and have babies that way, <laughs> they have learned, let's go talk to God. Maybe that's a better approach. And they were right, it was. And God intervened. So Isaac's 60 now. And the boys grow. So fast track through young manhood. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, what you usually hear in Sunday school, in Bible studies and such, is that Jake, or Esau was this manly man who was out there doing tough, manly stuff that his father really appreciated. But Jacob was a mama's boy who hung out in the kitchen and um, really was kind of weak and lame and, of course, uh, conniving and selfish and greedy and a liar and so on. And then commentators, Bible teachers, take that into the next couple chapters and work from that assumption as they look at the story of the blessing. Mm -hmm. But we, we need to slow down and see what the text actually says, and it says almost none of that. But as background, though, we need to remember that Abraham had 318 homeborn slaves. 
And from that, those were just the ones who had been adopted into his family. So we assume they're all married. So that puts us around 600 and some odd. And they all probably have two to five to 10 children. So we can multiply that. Then the other hangers on, the other slaves, the other servants, we're getting up at a sheikdom of around two to 3,000 people. Isaac, the scripture is very clear that Isaac took that and he added to that. And so when we hear that Esau is a cunning hunter, I, I, I'm not sure how, how you all were taught the Bible, but at least the impression that was left for me is that Esau went out every day and brought food home for the family and thus contributed to what was going on. You have, let's just, let's just say 2,000 people, if that's all it was. It's probably a lot more. How does one man bring home enough food to feed 2,000 people in a day's hunting? But it gets more complicated. Well, maybe he he trapped all kinds of big herds or just went out there with a buffalo roam and shot them machine gun like one after another and brought them all down. No, because he's a cunning hunter. If you could just sit in one place and shoot buffalo all day long, it, that doesn't take any cunning. That just takes <laughs> lots of arrows. Uh, the cunning means that game was scarce. And we see that at least on this one occasion, he'd been out for a good part of the day and come home hungry, having gotten nothing. Now, maybe that was an exception, but that if he were the sole source of food, even for his own family for one day, that would be awkward. If he's the sole Not source to say of, disastrous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if he's the sole source for the entire sheikdom, we, we, have, we have problems here. We, ha we have to understand that this is a combination cattle ranch and, and sheep herding farm, whatever they're called. And Isaac had added farming. So there's a lot of food stuff going on here, none of which is hunting. But Esau is a hunter, a really good hunter where game's really scarce and occasionally he doesn't bring in anything at all, but he goes out there and hunts regularly. Why? We have to stop and ask, why, why is he doing this? He's obviously not taking care of the family business. That has to be falling to someone else. Huh, I wonder, <laughs> wonder who. who that could be. Um, because if these are young men, let's say they're in their 30s, and at least some of this may have started them, but it goes on a lot longer. That's adding 30 to 60. J, uh, Isaac's around 90. He's probably not in full, because he didn't, he doesn't live quite as long as Abraham. And we find out that he's going blind too. So the person who obviously is in charge, and we get this confirmed as we read through Genesis, and Hebrews, is Jacob. Jacob is the man who is taking care of the family business. Esau is out hunting for fun. Oh, I'm sure he brings in stuff and adorns the, the family table with it. Everyone applauds him. And and, and you can argue, well, that's it. He uh, Jacob produces the, the standard food, but Esau brings in the really great food that no one else could possibly duplicate. Wait a second. Um, <laughs> When it comes down to duplication, um, Rebecca proves she can absolutely duplicate Esau's venison with some herbs and spices. So that's not it either. And so we now, now we look at, at Isaac and we're told that Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. It can't be because just of the texture and flavor. Rebecca could... could reproduce that so what is it what is it about the fact that it's venison and maybe i'm prejudiced by my own experiences in christian school but i strongly suspect what it is is dad said wow my son's just this great hunter look at what he brought in he's a man's man he's tough he's fast he's cunning look at the trophies that line his tent he did all of this. And when Isaac ate of it, he was participating, communing in his son's wonderful exploits, which I'm sure he completely convinces himself are the attributes that the forerunner of Messiah needs. I heard some teaching on this today that said that the verb is in the Hebrew, not there. It's implied, but the the literal reading it is more like he loved Esau because food mouth like it's this sort of <laughs> you know very uh 
visceral reaction. And that's interesting because of what's going to happen with Esau. If there was ever a food mouth kind of guy, <laughs> it was Esau. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, then we see Rebecca love Jacob. We're, that's not explained. But I think we have two explanations, one in the beginning and, a late, and another later on. When the servant came and said to her family, Abraham, you know him? And he's taken everything he's got. And he's given it to his only begotten son. And I want to, I'm sent to bring a bride from the ends of the earth to be the mother of the Messiah. She says, I'll go. Over the years as a school teacher, and particularly in Bible classes and chapel, I've asked young ladies a similar question. If someone showed up at your door and said, here's this missionary, he's got a son, they live off, you know, middle of nowhere. They've heard about you from your pastor and, and your friends. They've heard about your, your faith and your character. And they're asking you to go be this young man's bride. You'll probably never come home again. You'll probably never see anyone again. But his work is really important. It's blessed of the Spirit. And uh, people are coming to Christ by the hundreds, thousands. Uh, but this young man needs your help. Are you willing to go? And generally, most of the young ladies sit there and stare at me like, are you mad? <laughs> but every now Kinda and like then. Kind of like I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> but every now and then, a young lady, and I can remember a couple, will put up their hands and say, I'd go. She, Rebecca, went later on when the subject of, of marriage comes up again. We, we find out that Esau marries a couple cousins who are you know, as irreligious as he is. And Rebecca says to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of Edith's daughters of Heth. Of Jacob, take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as of these. This is before he even married his cousins. This is when he married the, the Canaanites, such as these, which are, are the daughters of the land. What good shall my life do to me? That's not a, a woman talking woman talk. That's a saint saying, I came from the ends of the earth to be part of the messianic line. And if Jacob marries a worldling like this, it's shot to pieces. Why am I here? And interestingly, Jake or Isaac gives her no back talk. It's like, okay, we're sitting in where you can find a godly wife. So when we're told that Rebecca loves Jacob, this is not well, mommy likes her favorite. Um, he, she has good reason because God told her, this is the one. This is the one with the promise. The elder shall serve the younger. This is the younger. God himself sent it to her. And God himself had bypassed Isaac in the process. I'm not sure what Isaac did with that. Well, you know, that's what she said, God said. But <sighs> I was going to say, how like... much credence was she given? <laughs> Apparently not nearly enough. Yeah, or he put he spun some kind of interpretation on it. I I don't believe that that Isaac is turning his back on the promise. I just think he's absolutely convinced that that it's going to be Esau. Mm -hmm. He has convinced himself of this. Rebecca sounds at the end of her rope a couple times yeah. when the the children are striving. It's like if if this is the way, and this is another thing that I was yeah. hearing about the Hebrew, that the verbs are not there. It's like, if thus, why me? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, if thus, why me? Well, there's another thing that we need to pick up that I skipped over. We got Esau, is, well, one other thing first, cunning hunter. Um, when I was teaching up north, up north is hunting territory. <laughs> and a lot of the young men in my class were hunters. And they didn't always like hearing a hunter being put down. And so they, they, they played the card they always used. He was thinning the herd. <laughs> what kind of hunter was he? He was a cunning hunter. Why was that? Because it was so hard to find him. Never mind. <laughs> He's not thinning the herd. Anyway, but what comes after that... I mean, here again, we can appeal to the, the Hebrew. Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents, and both those are important. Plain man. I have absolutely no idea why the King James translators rendered that plain, because that's not what it's translated any place else. It's used of Job, and it's used of Noah, and both times the King James renders it, they were perfect in the eyes of the Lord. Not sinless perfection, but maturity, the mature, complete, grown substantial in their faith. That's God's reckoning here about Jacob. Esau is out playing games in the field, and Jacob is a mature, godly man. God just said so, like Noah, like Job. Well, how does, that, how does that, all the stuff that's coming fit in? Well, it won't fit in unless you understand what God said about him and actually trust God to know the, 
to no men's hearts. But the other thing, dwelling intense. See, he's intense. He's a mommy's boy. He's inside all the time. No. <laughs> First of all, intense means that he was, he had no established foundation or house or city. Hebrews picks this up and says, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for they look for a city which had foundations as builder and maker is God. Jacob, like Isaac, had enough money to go into the nearest town and buy a mansion and settle down and have a wonderfully pleasant central life. And they refused. They refused to settle for any city but God's. And they were going to wait for that. And they were going to do that by dwelling in tents. And Jacob identifies himself with his father's calling and his grandfather's calling by continuing not to have a fixed foundation, a fixed settlement, moving from place to place, having not inheriting one square of land within his lifetime, but receiving it all by promise. And secondly, it simply means that he followed the cattle. The cattle move, you go with them. The cattle eat up this grass, the sheep eat up this grass, you move your tents to the next place. He was the guy who was running the family business. It doesn't mean he hung out indoors all the time and let other people do the hard work. It means he was the guy who was in charge. This is the, um, this is the foreman's tent. He's the prince of this sheikdom. And while his brother's off um, looking for things to make things go, he's ordering around two to 3,000 people and getting his hands dirty. Because later on, when Jacob gives account of himself, he obviously knows how to play midwife to sheep, play nurse to sheep, chase off the wolves and the bandits. He hasn't just sat back and done paperwork. He's been out there in the field working with all mm. of this stuff. So um, all of this has, we have to take into account. So in other words, he, he's also being like focused on the mission of his father's house. Yeah, absolutely. And somehow Isaac's missing that. And a, a word to fathers. It's easy to, to slam Isaac here. It's also his father's very, very easy to favor one child over the other because this child is either more like you or more like what you wish you had been. And uh, with having three daughters who are respectively prophet, priest, and king, queen, king, um, it's, <laughs> <Rope>. it's, it's <laughs> person of action. It's easy. It would be easy for me to say, well, this one's more like me. This one's not at all like me. This is what I wish I could be. And to dole out favoritism on those, on, along those lines. And it hasn't been a huge temptation, but I do have to watch it now and then and make sure that I am in turn recognizing each of them for what God has made them to be. I'd be glad for them that they find their fulfillment in Christ and in his calling, not in my preconceived notion of what my daughters ought to look like. There's one other thing I would throw in with regard to Jacob, because it's kind of cute and funny. We're not going to get there otherwise tonight. When he finally goes and looks for a wife, he comes to... Uh, Actually, I'm, I'm just going to jump there and read it. He, he's, he's sent on and he comes to um, Haran and uh, to, to where Rachel is. And he says, uh, verse 20, this is chapter 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked and behold a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and the great stone was upon the well's mouth. And then there were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place. Jacob said unto them, My brother, and no wince me. And they said, Of Haran are we? He said unto them, Know you Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, Yeah, we know him. He said unto him, Is he well? And they said, He's well. Oh, behold, Rachel's daughter cometh with the sheep. He said, Jacob says, Lo, it's yet high day, neither is the time that the cattle should be gathered together. What are you the sheep and go and feed them? And he said, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together and till they roll the stone from the well's mouth. And then we water the sheep. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. Came to pass when Laban saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother brother. Now, there's some hugging and kissing that goes on afterwards because they're relatives. I, I, want, I do want you to notice a couple things. 
Here's Jacob coming upon these guys who are just lounging there, waiting for them, somebody, not named, to roll the stone away so that their flocks can be taken care of. And Jacob's after the first, um, are you from Haran? You know, Laban, all that. It's like, guys, it's uh, not time to pull the sheep in. You should really be watering them and getting back into the fields. This is the <laughs> voice of the expert in the field looking at lamers saying, why are you being lame? There's stuff to happen here. You know, when, when you're really good at something, you've done it for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and you see someone breaking the first principles, it's real hard sometimes to shut up and say <laughs> their problem, their loss. I'm not. So he, he does point this out. But they say, well, you know, there's this big stone over the well and we can't move it. So we wait till everybody gets together and then they move it for us. And then we get on with that. Now, Jacob's whole response to that is, um, again, suggestive of his character. Because he sees Rachel and we know that Rachel's beautiful. And he's come looking for a wife. And she's an outdoorsy sort of girl. She shares his profession. She's a shepherdess. Um, and she's in need. And so he goes over to this big rock that they have to move. And he himself, by his lonesome, moves the rock and lets the water out. <laughs> In word, he's buff. And this, he's is, not... this is the Old Testament version of carrying like eight chairs after yeah. fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's he's doing a little bit of showing off here because he can't. Because now the other thing, the other question we always look at. And I don't have. We don't have time to, to work through all the math. But here's a story problem for anybody who's interested. How old was Jacob at this point? And we generally think, oh, well, you know, probably 30 something. No, if you count through all the numbers and you have to work backward from the time that Joseph stands before Pharaoh when he's 30 and then calculate when Jacob appears before Pharaoh and how old he is and then work backward to when Joseph was born and then backward through serving for Leah and serving for Rachel and serving those extra years. By the time you're all done with it, it's a very complicated story problem. This is why you need to know how to do story problems, children. <laughs> uh, we find out that Jacob, I don't remember the exact year because I always, I always miss by a couple, but he's about 74. He's not a spring chicken uh, by our standards, but he was a, he, he was a guy who was used to doing hard, tough, strength-demanding things and was not afraid to show off for this young lady. And he was not afraid to tell these incompetents how to run the family business. So, again, this this is not the frail, weak, nam namby-pamby sort of guy who hangs out in the kitchen besides mom and all he knows is the difference between oregano and Italian spices. Uh, <laughs> this is a very manly sort of man. So when we control, compare Jacob and Esau, the difference is not between um, their, their physical strength and such. It's about faith. Now, as we go back to um, chapter 25, we come to the story that everybody knows. Jacob saw pottage, and of course he gets flack because what's he doing in the kitchen? Real men don't work in the kitchen. All the best chefs of Europe and America, sorry, until at least till recently, were male. They also wouldn't let women be chefs until yeah. recently. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. But it's always been a manly profession as well as something that women do. Of course, I know I have known men who can't even fry an egg. And, yeah, honey, you go make us some food so I don't have to starve. And they're not exaggerating. Anyway, he saw pottage and Esau came from the field and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage. Now, uh, Emily, you may have looked up the Hebrew here too. <laughs> yes. The uh, well, it's it's the pottage is not there. It's more like feed me the red uh, that red red stuff. stuff. Yeah, red, red redness. Red red. Yeah. Get red, red. red. <laughs> yeah. Someone rendered it. Give some of that red to this red, because what <laughs> comes out of this is therefore his name was called Red Edom. Um, so apparently there were some tomatoes or cayenne or something in the thing that turned it red. It looked good. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. The birthright at this point in redemptive history was the right to serve as priest for the family, to offer the sacrifices and be the instructor in God's word, to maintain the covenant life, to take care of mom and dad 
in their later age and to be the ancestor of Messiah. It's not until later that the genealogy and the birthright are separate, they're separated. So at this point, obviously Esau is claiming it and dad is backing him up. Although God had said that's not the way it's going to go, Isaac was ignoring that. Whatever justification he thought he had, and Esau's apparently not caring, probably proud of the fact that dad likes him, but dad always liked me more. But um, when it comes to this, when Jacob says this, Esau says, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do me? I'm really, really hungry. What, pro what in the world will the promise of Messiah ever do for me? the way I feel now. I don't know whether Jacob seriously thought Esau was going to do this. It's kind of hard to imagine someone selling the hope of the world for a bit of fast food. Especially if you believe in it. <laughs> yeah, if you mm -hmm. believe in it. So um, was he joking? Was he just saying, hey, yeah, when hell freezes over? And Esau says, well, look at the temperature. It's falling real fast. What? You're kidding. Fine. Uh, yeah. And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore unto him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Thus Jacob gave Esau bread. So he, he actually added something to deal. He gave him some bread to go with the soup and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright couple things but sweetening sweetening the deal with the bread made it all yeah. work. Totally. <laughs> it made it all work yeah totally uh people have accused jacob of driving a hard bargain esau is hungry he's faint he's about to die how dare you be the the rugged capitalist who will not give him even something to eat without getting a deal out of it yeah he got over that real fast didn't he he eats the soup and bread and gets up and walks out. He's not that bad. Besides, wasn't he supposed to be the really tough guy who can handle all this? He despised his birthright. The writer of Hebrews has stuff to say about this. I'm sorry, I did not put a marker in the bottle. But toward the end of the book, um, he says this, Follow peace with all men. This is chapter 12, verse 14. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he yet found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears." At no point does God ever rebuke Jacob for this deal. Esau gets rebuked in both Testaments in no uncertain terms, and he's called a fornicator and a profane person who despised his birthright and who in the end found no repentance. The Bible has nothing nice to say about him. It does say that from the womb, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. So it's not my intention to go on into the story of the blessing. And again, we need to remember that none of these men is perfect. But having said that, we do need to see that whatever uh, Jacob is doing, he is committed to the promise. And if he's going to cut corners, it will be for the sake of the promise. Esau doesn't care one thing about the promise. It's all about his gut and, his sta and satisfying his sensuality here and now. I'm reminded of a couple things. The first is the bribery laws in the case laws of Israel, mm. where you were not punished <laughs> for offering a bribe because you might have to do that to get justice. Yeah. But the judge who was bribed had very harsh penalties. I had um, never that reminds a connection me of this. Good girl. Yeah, I the will bless you I if you give me food. Um, Dad, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. Oh, but I need some more food. The other thing I'm reminded of is Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. Two brothers. One deals with animals. The other deals with vegetables, apparently. Lentils. Red lentils. Mm -hmm. But there's not anything about keeping animals that's more righteous no. than mm -hmm. keeping vegetables. It's the will of God, in this case, that separates Jacob from Esau. 
and of course, you know, you, you can't stretch that too far. Jacob is taking care of the flocks and herds. So he is also associated with animals. But mm -hmm. um, well, what you're saying, I think, is it's, we look at the Cain and Abel story and see that Cain's the farmer and Abel's the shepherd. It would be easy to draw exactly the wrong lesson. Uh, right. Good works. If you really want to be good, become a shepherd. That's it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because farmers, I don't know about farmers. Cain was a farmer. That's pretty evil. I mean, you can make the same conclusion here about hunters. Hunters are evil. After all, there's not only one other hunter that's ever mentioned. That's Nimrod. Well, you know, farmers are, or hunters have their function. But when you're farming, when a culture is just one of hunting, and there is no farming, no taking dominion over the over the planet, that's going to have some no economic tilling the soil. No tilling the soil. That's going to take have some economic repercussions real fast. Talk to the Native Americans, who shoved farming off on the women and the slaves. But the, the Braves were hunters. I mean, it, it had it produced economic problems for them, and that mentality has stayed with them in many cases. It's very, it's very sad. Sometimes it's hard to make the break and say, no, our culture was wrong about this. We need, it's a hunting is fine as far as it goes, but sooner or later we do need to be committed to tilling the soil as well and industry and you know there's a whole range of things that God's people need to be involved in. And Esau, well, the main issue here is his sensuality. He wants, it's a whole lot more fun to go out and hunt. Uh, the exercise, the fresh air, the thrill of, of nailing your, your target, uh, seeing it bleed out in front of you, cutting it out. I mean, that's all. It can be very heady and exciting, and there's nothing wrong with any of that. It can be a good thing. But... Don't tell Peter about this episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think they're listening. But, I'm not uh... too worried. <laughs> when that becomes an idol that takes the place of pursuing the promise of god that's that's where the problems come and that's where they come for all of us we can look at all these men they all stumbled over idols as we do they all had places where they recast the promise in terms of their idols and and err from the path but god is faithful and i think one thing we have to keep reminding ourselves is that this hero of these stories is not abraham isaac or jacob the heroes of these mm -hmm. stories is God himself. The hero is the coming Messiah. Jesus mm -hmm. is the hero of these stories. And uh, it's the, the pitch to us, the gospel pitch is not, try and be like Abraham. Try and be like Jacob. No, it's trust in Jesus because, and, and that brings us back to where you began, Emily, and what Dr. Voss was saying. We, in Abraham, we see the father who gives up his only begotten son. In Isaac, we see the son who lays down his life, hoping for resurrection. In Jacob, we see, we see the one who opens up rivers of living water for the whole mm -hmm. flock. Isaac After doesn't, rolling away the stone. Rolling away the stone. Ah. Isaac doesn't come back. Isaac stays out there. But Jacob is the one who comes as the active power of God in the world to procure the bride. You can contrast the story of Isaac, where the, where the servant is sent to get the bride while the son remains mm -hmm. where he is. And here, where the heir goes into the world, returns to the world, and actively courts, pursues, and obtains the bride in his own person, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or Jesus from three different angles, depending on how you want to look at it. Because again, he's the hero of the story, and I don't, I, I don't know what else you want to have, you want to talk about. But I don't want to leave without um, making some obvious parallels to Beauty and the Beast. Yay! <laughs> I was hoping we would get there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I first came to uh, to Cornerstone, I, I've been watching Beauty and the Beast for a while, and I had this little lecture I did on it and made comparison of Bell's song at the beginning. Um, She's, uh, she talks to sheep, she feeds them from the book that's about the, the prince in disguise, and you just go down through the whole list of things. And over the years, people ask me, well, gee, this is Disney, you don't think they really meant to do that? I don't know, probably not. They probably just know a good story when they steal one. <laughs> it, was only, <laughs> it, was, it was only years and years later in our school library, I came across a, a book and I don't remember the name. Adam Raccoon, I think, is the character. I forget the name of the... Uh, sorry, Brother in Christ, I forget your name, but I know you've done a lot of children's books along this line where Adam Raccoon, you get it? 
He's rescued by <laughs> the lion, the king. Yeah. It's full of biblical imagery. And it was this man who was in charge of setting the, the storyline and the artwork for the beasts. He's a devout mm. Christian and has said publicly in interviews, yeah, I wanted to communicate my Christian faith by showing resurrection, the power of God's mm. resurrection. So I no longer know whether to what degree he had any control over this whole story arc, to what degree he made suggestions about the earlier part. But I do know that when Gaston shows up, he steps out of shadow. Before we even see him, we know he's killed something. The gun's reeking of sulfur and brimstone. Uh, he assaults the bride, tries to take her book from her because it has no pictures in it. Uh, he is basically trying to seduce her. He shoves the book into the ground. But later on, we, as, as his friends celebrate him, we have the great line, every last inch of him is covered with hair. That's Esau. And Gaston is most certainly Esau. He is sensual. He lives for his gut. He lives for his eyes. He lives for the thrill. He cannot understand thinking. His first resort is to his muscles or to his gun. Uh, mm. And he wants Belle simply because she's beautiful. No concept of character. And of course, in his death, he falls into the abyss. So, but when the, um, when the three triplets at the beginning are singing about him, there's a line where mm -hmm. he's such a tall, dark, strong, and handsome. The sheet music says brute, I believe. But if you listen to the original soundtrack, it sure sounds like Prince. So what mm -hmm. is he? Is he Prince or a brute? Well, that, of course, is the, the whole story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Gaston is like a brute. He's like an animal. He's like a beast and never repents of it. Whereas the beast, the type of character, is in truth the prince. But we wait for resurrection before that's fully revealed. Mm. So there's 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 a lot of wonderful stuff going on in that movie. A lot of stuff that we could talk about profitably with friends. And children. Um, even if you don't like Disney, there's stuff there that's more than worth your time. And uh, if, you, if you're teaching through uh, Jacob and Esau, I don't think it would hurt to play Beauty and the Beast and say, you want to know what Gaston's like? I mean, you want to know what Issa's like? Look at Gaston. Only imagine all the hair is red. <laughs> <laughs> Those redheads. Mm. No souls, right? <laughs> right. That's the joke. Anyway, so I think it's safe to say that we all wholeheartedly recommend Beauty and the Beast. Of course. Is that safe to say? Yeah. Yeah. Any other recommendations for today? Uh, Greg, would you like to go first? or should I... <laughs> You should go first. <laughs> Sweet. Um... <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and recommend some nice, depressing Russian literature for everyone mm. in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Oh! oh! Amen! <laughs> it, My kids are I, reading that right now. Oh, Yay! really? Yes! Good! What a joy um, for them. It is... I, I still have phenomenal memories of reading that in your class, and... I, if I remember correctly, I think every single person in our class was like, this is amazing. <laughs> um, and all sorts of people have different outlooks on it. I remember at the time thinking this was so wonderful because it was like, you're basically sitting there going, oh, wow, I'm connecting with a person who purposely murdered someone just to find out what <laughs> it felt like. This is really weird. And, and, and I'm feeling sorry for him and hoping he escapes getting caught. Right. Yeah. There's all yeah. of that. And you're like, I'm a horrible person. And then you realize, oh, that's what he's realizing too. That's good. <laughs> and there's, there's probably a lot more depths to be planned. I'm planning on rereading it this year. Uh, hopefully before the end of the year, it is somewhere in the, the middle bottom part of my to read list at the moment. Um, I hope I get to it this year. Cause I, I really want to, explore that again but fantastic book fantastic memories associated with it and everyone should read it at least once the um, question the final question i ask the kids who should be answering even as excuse me even as we speak is um given that you've been walked through the mind of a murderer how is it that we say this is a christian novel where are the christian themes <laughs> and um, some some of it's obvious uh, i think some of it's far more subtle like Oh, so you think you're too good to be a murderer, do you? Really? 
Mm-hmm. You would never do that. Uh-huh. Right. Maybe you don't know yourself as well as you think. But then, of course, there's the ongoing theme of resurrection, the story of Lazarus mm-hmm. and so on. It's probably good to keep like a list of characters nearby, along oh, with all of their various yes, with their alternate, <laughs> alternate names. names. Yes, because I remember reading through that and being like, "Who's this guy?" <laughs> oh, it sounds like it's this. Guy. Why are they giving him a different name in this sentence? I don't understand. <laughs> no, so I didn't struggle with that as much, except during one section where I was <laughs> mixing up. It was like the good guy and the bad guy. Like I had them exactly (laughs) switched. It was like Lucian and uh, the guy who who marries the sister. I forget his name. Resume him. I I think I remember there there are two characters who have like a name that big. Like obviously there's Raskolnikov, but um, there's him and another character whose nickname starts with an R. And sometimes they'll be in the same paragraph. Yeah, like throughout the book and it's like yeah. could you have possibly chosen a worse <laughs> section to do this in <laughs> well you know and I, i'm sure somebody has written about this because i think i've been told they have but we have this tendency when it comes to long names or unfamiliar names <laughs> to look at the first letter mm-hmm. <laughs> the r guy the and R-guy. We, never, exactly. we don't stop and actually pronounce it we just take in the, the the phonogram that looks like this it's about this long has this about this many letters and starts with that the r guy <laughs> and was talking to the p guy and about the yeah. s girl <laughs> I, I know that's i do that so often when i'm reading through like a fantasy novel mm-hmm. and they choose to use some kind of yeah, right. weird spelling yeah it's unpronounceable uh, so <laughs> why bother spelling and it out the only thing that saved me, one of the book, the book series I, I love is uh, the Stormlight Chronicles, which the, the spelling and naming convention is unrecognizable it, to me. I don't think it's anything Western. And um, I, I the only reason I survived was, was because I listened to the audiobook of it first. And then when I picked <laughs> up the book or tried to like search a character's name online, I was like, how do you spell this? Let's try that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Emily, I'm still thinking. What about you? Okay. Well, on the subject of names that you never pro- never bother pronouncing in your head, I'm going to recommend <laughs> the comic books Asterix and Obelix. Oh yes, because that is also exactly good. what I did as a as a child. There, there's it's this Belgian comic, and there are all sorts of puns in it: Latin, English, French puns, just all over the place. It just hilarious so much that when they translate it into other languages they count the puns per square and (laughs) try to replicate them because there's no point in translating literally because it's all just wordplay yeah um but it's it's just very fun stories i've been reading them since i was a child and uh yeah the the chief of this little gaulish village uh his name is vital statistics (laughs) <laughs> which is something I never caught because I never read the long V name that ends in X because all of the Gaul's names ends in X. So Amazing. it's set in uh, in ancient Gaul when Julius Caesar is oh. taking over. There's one village of indomitable Gauls that's holding out. So that's my recommendation. Does it have like a special potion or something? Or am I misremembering? Yeah, uh, the, the, the druid get a fix. Um, uh. Makes a magic <laughs> potion. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, speaking of the the Gaulish um, tendency to have names that end in X, uh, there's there's a certain Gaulish general that uh, Caesar faced off against, uh, who I know how to pronounce it now, or at least I know one of the pronunciations, and I learned it from Dan Carlin's Hardcore History podcast when he was talking through it which I also recommend. I'll just throw that in there at the end. Um, and he, he pronounces it Vercingetorix. And every okay. single time, like I was going like, who's this new guy? And then like, I looked at the show notes and I saw it spelled out. I was like, oh, Vercingetorix. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you pronouncing it that way? <laughs> yeah. Fun oh. with names. Indeed. Does that inspire any recos, Greg? <sighs> Anything else with unpronounceable names? No. Well, well, does Thompson and Thompson count? And <laughs> yes. Did you, and did you get I, I get the that illusion? reference. You got that reference. Ten. Yes. 
Oh, um, another Belgian doing, comic. Since we're is that Belgian? I didn't even know. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like so many other things, when I, I, I discovered as a child, because my mom, trying to do the best she could for me, uh, <laughs> bought me Children's Digest, which was a children's version of Reader's Digest, and um, the comic Tintin appeared in there. It was it was the um, it was book version. It was Secret of the Unicorn, I believe, is the title. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was really great. It was, it's, it's, it's a mystery. It's well drawn. It's clean. It's clever. It's not above a child's um, mentality, but it's not it's not dumbed down. The two British detectives who are sort of a take on British detectives generally, I guess, <laughs> are named Thompson and Thompson. With a P and without a P. Without a P. Thompson <laughs> and Thompson. Thompson. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, and I, I just loved it as a kid. And we got almost to the end and my subscription lapsed. Oh no! And Catastrophe. I, and we live in this little little town in the middle of Northern California where bookstores were few and used bookstores of quality were fewer. It wouldn't be, I think, until I went to London that I actually saw a, a, a hardback version. If it wasn't there, it was, it was some some obscure place where I went, not not expecting it, I found a hardback version. It might not have been London, it might have been earlier, but it was years and years and years. And I found it and finally read to the end. I <laughs> found out what in the world all the clues meant, and I was so excited. Mm -hmm. But it's fun. There's a series of them. They kind of the series each series kind of runs into the other. There's a little bit of, of, of magic and mysticism if that were issue in, in some of them, but not in all by any means. And and Tintin, um, and his friends go to the moon, they go to South America, they go to a desert island and search a treasure, they do all kinds of things. It's it's a nice adventure story for, for young kids, probably junior high or maybe a little younger. But I think parents could read it and, and enjoy the story with them. And so we come back to C.S. Lewis's dictum. If it's not good enough for an adult to read, not good enough for a kid to read. <laughs> That's right. I've actually been revisiting Tintin because I was trying to learn French for a while. Um, yeah. I sort of turned my attention to other things. But there's this long period of time when you're getting the present tense verbs mm. and you don't have the past tense verbs. So it's very hard to find anything, even children's books, to yeah. read that you can actually understand and make sense of. And so I have some of the little black and white mini booklets of Tintin comics. Mm. And because it's comic books, everything's in present tense and I can <laughs> read it just fine. So, Let's see, yeah. the action of the characters, what's going on? Yeah. All and right. I've read them all in English, so that helps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you guys so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks also so, to you, David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at halting, halting towards Zion at gmail.com. You can like our Facebook page. You can follow me on Twitter and Goodreads. Thank you so much. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>